am just thankful for the opportunity to be here tonight. I'm thankful for the call that God has placed in my life. When I was at a very young age, I felt the call of God to be a missionary. It was something I really never thought that I would ever be able to do, so I never really told anyone. We know there was no peace, there was no joy, until I said, Lord, here am I, send me. I'll go wherever you want me to go. I know the 10 months I spent in the Philippines was 10 months that I wouldn't trade for anything, because we know being in the Lord's will is the only time that you would be happy. Now, tonight I'd just like to share a little bit about the history of the Philippines, about our work there. See, the Philippines is a group of about 11 large and about 7,000 smaller islands lying off the southeast coast of Asia. It's separated from Vietnam and China by the South China Sea. The total land area of all the islands is about 115,700 square miles. The two largest islands are Luzon, which is about the size of Kentucky, and Mindanao, it's about the size of Indiana. These two islands account for about two-thirds of the total land area. The Philippines has a population of almost 70 million, and about 83% of the population is Roman Catholics. The people in the Philippines speak in about nine different major languages, and these nine major languages are divided into about 90 local and tribal dialects. About 11 million of the Filipinos can speak in English in addition to their own dialect. See, Tagalog is a national language, but Ilocano is also used in most parts of the Philippines. The Philippines' economy is primarily agricultural. About 60% of the working people are engaged in farming, forestry, and fishing. The common livestock consists of water buffaloes, carabaos, horses, mules, cattle, and pigs. See, bamboo is an all-purpose wood. The Filipinos will build huts and fences. They'll build ladders from the giant stalks of grass. It's also used for even making floors and furniture. And the young boys even enjoy taking the stalks from the bamboo and using them as fishing poles. At our Bible school, we have around 25 students from at least 12 different areas of the Philippines. We've had almost 100 students graduate from our Bible school. And many of our students will, when they graduate, they'll go out and either pioneer other churches or they'll help our, some of our pastors there struggling to pioneer a church. They'll help them get the church established. Now, right now, we have at least 30 established churches and many more pioneer works. Now, it's just really a blessing to see our pastors are really eager to work for the Lord. Now, this past summer, we went to visit one of our churches in Bugay, Kaigion. It's up in the northern part of the Philippines. It's located in a village that's surrounded on about three sides by water. It's a big fishing community. It's really something to watch the big, they call them bully bully fishing boats come in and they'll unload all these different kinds of fish. And it would be nothing to see 50 to 100 different kinds of fish, all different sizes, that they bring off of these big boats. And they say in this village alone, there is 500 children, not counting the adults. And before we were to our destination where we were supposed to meet our pastor, we had about 200 children that just surrounded our jeepney. And the reason they surrounded our jeepney was because they very seldom get to see an, an American. And there was brother and sister Cook and their family and me. So when there was probably about six of us that were Americans, these 200 Filipino children just surrounded the jeep. They started climbing on the jeep. They wouldn't let us out of the jeep. We had to sit in the jeep for about 10 or 15 minutes before we could get out of the jeep. And it was like everywhere we went those three days that we were there, we probably had 50 to 100 children that would follow us everywhere. I know your heart really goes out to them. I know I always had a burden for the children, but my burden became stronger as I saw the many hundreds of children that were eager to learn, that were just reaching out, wanting someone to care. But we know if we just had more laborers that could go into those areas and to reach the children. And as my junior year of Bible school, we had to write a song in hymn composition class. And as I always had a burden for children, I share my burden with others as I wrote my song. It was reach out to the children. The words reach out to the children, both near and far. They all need his love, no matter where they are. For in his heart he's longing, just as he did before, to hold them in his lonely arms before they've gone too far. Reach out to the children, show them Jesus cares. Don't hesitate to call their names down on your knees in prayer. For somewhere now there's some lost sheep that needs a shepherd's love. He's standing there with open arms while he's waiting in the fold. For some would wait and others try to satisfy. 
Dreams and hopes they've held so close, only in this life. Yet somewhere in the dark of night, a lonely heart awaits to see the look of a father's love only found in Jesus' face. And I never realized the need was so great to reach out to the children until I visited our church there. You just saw the many hundreds of children that were just reaching out, wanting someone to care, wanting someone to love them. I know my desire when I returned to the Philippines is to really learn the language so that I'm able to go into these areas where there is a lot of the children and so we'd be able to have even children's crusades for the children. Many of our pastors will have crusades for the adults. They go into the areas where there isn't churches. They'll have crusades for the adults, but there's nothing for the children. And my desire is just to go into these areas and to have something for the children so that the children can also be reached. Now many of our pastors will not only hold Bible studies in their own area where they have their church, but they'll even go out into other areas where there is not a church and they have Bible studies, and they have a desire to even establish a church there. I know each one of our juniors and seniors in our Bible school are assigned to one of our free gospel churches, and each weekend they go to that church, and they will be there to help the pastor out for that weekend. You know, whether it's in teaching Sunday school with Bible clubs, um, passing out tracts, whatever they're needed to do, the students are there to help them. Our public school system is a little bit different than the public schools here in America. Public schools in the Philippines only go from grades 1 through 10. Elementary education is free, but if you want to go from like 7th to 10th grade, you have to pay tuition. The parents are required to buy their own children's school books. Many of the parents cannot afford to buy their children's school books. Maybe two or three children in the same classroom will have to share the same school books. Most of the classes are taught in English but a few of them are taught in Tagalog, which is their national language. One thing that really surprised me when we went to the Philippines was in the public schools, you're allowed to go into the public schools and teach the children about God. I know this is one of the ministries of our Bible school. Every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we'll take a group of our Bible school students and we'll go into a different one of our public schools and we're allowed to teach the children about God for one half hour. I know each year we have to renew our permit to be able to do this. And each year they say, well, we probably won't be able to do it next year. We're just thankful how this last year was able to get the permit renewed again. I noticed the ones of the public schools told me they says, well, you have to have your services at the same time the Catholics have theirs. Well, the Catholics was having theirs at 9 o'clock in the morning. I said, our students are only available from 1 to 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I said, our students are doing this as an extra ministry. I said, they are in classes themselves from 9 to 10. And some of the head teachers at the public school said, well, don't tell the superintendent of the schools, but we'll let you come from 1 to 1.30. So we just thank God the Lord worked it out that we didn't have to have it just when the Catholics did. It's really something, too, because this is a time when all, of our, when all the children are home on their lunch break, and many of the children would come back early from their lunch break just so they could hear about God. Now, another thing that surprised me, too, was the hospitals in the Philippines. In the Philippines, you're allowed to also go into the hospitals and pass out tracts. You can go around room to room, pray for the patients. They even let you have church services within the hospital. You know, it was each week we took a group of our students, and we'd have at least two services in the hospital each week. Just really something to see as we'd go room to room and how different people from maybe the other end of the of that floor would come to us. They said, would you come and have a service for us? Would you come and pray for our family member? It was just really a blessing to see how God really moved. And it was one Sunday, there was a group of at least 50 to 100 doctors and nurses. We'd already had, I think it was three services that day. The student said to me, they said, we have this last area of the hospital to do. Are we going to do it or are we just going to go back to the Bible school? Because it was getting late, we had service that night. I said, I feel we should just go ahead in this last section. I said, do this last section of the hospital. Because we went in there, there was at least 50 to 100 doctors and nurses that were staying around. They just he got out of one of their meetings. As so we asked permission at the nurse's station, may we you know, pray for the patients, pass out tracts, and maybe even have a service for the patients if they want it. They said, well, why just for the patients? They said, here's 50 to 100 doctors and nurses. We need to hear the gospel too. We have a service for us. So it was just something to see how even that day we was able to minister to the doctors and nurses. Our weather in the Philippines is a little bit different than it is here. We have mainly two seasons, dry season, rainy season. Dry season is from about November to May. You get hardly any rain at all. 
And in rainy seasons from about June to October, and you get rain just about every afternoon, they say if it rains in the morning for two or three days, you know, there's a typhoon coming. And the typhoon is a really bad storm that we get where it gets very windy, it rains very hard. You have to be very careful when you go outside because the winds get really bad and there's branches, trees flying through the air. Just, you really have to be careful during a typhoon and usually at this time too, the electric is out. You may be without electric for anywhere from 12, 24 to 36 hours. And I know there's, they say usually about three bad typhoons hit the area where our Bible school is every year. Whereas past year, we didn't have any typhoon at all hit our Bible school. We had a few real small ones, but none of the major typhoons that usually hit. There's one that hit Manila, which is probably about 10 hours driving distance from our Bible school, about one week before I was supposed to fly out of Manila to come back to America. I know they said it was the most powerful typhoon that ever had hit the Philippines in a decade. It churned up floodwaters that killed at least 65 people, destroyed thousands of homes, and it cut electricity to about a third of the country. Billboards crashed to the ground. There was like 125 mile per hour winds toward the roofs from houses. To keep from being blown away, the reporters had to tie themselves to a lamppost as they broadcasted from the Manila Bay. And they even had up to like 140 mile per hour winds. I know you never think that a typhoon or the storm could do so much damage. So I went back into Manila about a week later. I left to come fly back to America and you just saw the damage they had done. And the big trees that you would never think could be uprooted. They were uprooted, branches were everywhere. Usually in Manila they keep it very clean, keep the branches picked up, but they had been working for over a week and they still could not get the city cleaned up. And in the Philippines too, they have a lot of different customs for their holidays than we do. One is on Easter, every year at Good Friday at 12 noon, there's a man that they will crucify on a cross. So now I'm to a cross and he will stay there for 10 minutes and then they take him off. And he does this every year and the reason he says he does this is because his mother is very sick and he feels if he does this every year that it will bring healing for his mother. And we never really believed that this was true until we was there this past year and we was able to get to see it being done. And another one of their different customs is on November 1st, they call it All Saints Day. It's a time where a lot of the people that are not Christians go into the cemeteries and they claim that they can communicate with the dead. So it's a time of a lot of parties, a lot of drinking going on. They'll even take a full plate of food, just like you would sit down to eat a complete meal, and they'll set it on the casket. And they feel that their loved ones will come back for that food during the night. And I know it's just really something to see as we walk through the cemeteries, passing out tracts to thousands of people that were just there. So we was passing out tracts, people just looked at us, like, you mean you, someone really cares about me? You mean there is hope for us? And as we passed out several thousand tracts that night, I said to the students, I said, if even one or two souls would be one, I said, it would be worth it. I know at Thanksgiving, they have a little bit of different custom than we do. It's a time of a lot of revivals at our churches, and it's a time for the members of the churches to bring in a tithe of their harvest and thanks to the Lord. At Christmas, it's different in many ways, too. The weather is about 75 to 80 degrees during the daytime and about 60 degrees at night. They said 60 degrees was about the lowest it ever got, but this year they said it even went down to 50 degrees. 50 degrees to us here in America is warm, but to the Filipinos, they're used to... 100, 120 degree weather just about every day. 50 degrees is very cold for them. Everywhere you go, there's groups of young people singing Christmas carols. They either go from house to house or they even go from business to business in the towns singing Christmas carols. And usually for their efforts, they're either rewarded with pesos, which is our type of money, or two pig, it's a type of a rice cake that the Filipinos really enjoy, or candy. See, at this time, Christmas decorations are everywhere. Many of them are made from bamboo strips or even just colored tissue paper. One thing the Filipinos use, whatever they have, to make things. Now, the basket on the back table, many people think it's made out of wood or some kind of bamboo, but it's made out of newspaper. Somehow they wet the newspaper and they roll it up and somehow they weave it together 
And once it dries, they shellac it. And it makes it look like it's made out of wood, but it's really made out of newspaper. And it's really something to see how the Filipinos really use whatever they have to make things. We know in, during the month of October, usually we'll have a preacher from America come over to preach our holiness, con holiness convocation. And at this time, usually we run a big auditorium. It's a time where all of our churches will get together for three days of, you know, just hearing preaching of the word. Just really something to see how the people are really open. And this past year, for each of the evening services we had, between four to 500 people would come out for each of the evening services. Just something to see, too, how the, the people really got in around the altar and was really searching to get something from God. And during the month of April, we have our youth camp. And in between Christmas and New Year's, we have our yearly youth rally. It's a time where all of our young people from our churches will get together at our Bible school. They say there's more than like 200 children will gather there for like three days of preaching of the word. They have different Bible games between the churches, different contests and things. It's really something to see how the children do. Children are really open to hear the gospel. They have a lot of different customs about their birthdays in the Philippines. Usually here in America, maybe your parents or friends might have a birthday party for you. But in the Philippines, whoever's having a birthday has a party for everyone else. And to us here, something like spaghetti might be a complete meal to us. But to Filipinos, spaghetti would be just like a snack. Now, for my birthday when I was there, we made spaghetti and a cake and ice cream. Then the Filipinos sat down and ate two or three big platefuls of rice with fish and vegetables after they already ate a big plate of spaghetti, cake, and ice cream. This is even the girls. I know different times we'd say to them, how can you eat so much? Because us Americans, we wasn't used to eating that much, but to Filipinos, if they don't eat rice for every meal three times a day, they have not eaten their meal. If you have a Filipino come to your house and it's around mealtime, you have to ask them, did you have anything to eat? If you say, did you eat supper? If they didn't have rice, they would say no. So you have to be very careful when the Filipinos come to your houses, because if they did not eat rice, then they do not consider they have eaten a meal. Their food is mainly rice, fish, and vegetables. You can get other kinds of meat, but it's a lot more expensive. So Filipinos mainly eat, like the seafood, which you know would be a lot cheaper. In the Philippines, they don't have grocery stores like we do here. They have mostly open markets. And to buy your meat, you have to go about 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning to buy your meat. And you walk into a big, like, cement building, and in the upstairs, there might be about 100 different meat dealers. And it's just counters all around, and there's big hooks hanging down from the ceiling with all this meat hanging on it. And you have to find a meat dealer that you like their meat, and that's who you buy your meat off of. And I know the Filipinos eat even the fat from the meat. I know it's nothing to ask for maybe one kilo or it's almost like one pound of beef. And you might get a half a pound of beef and a half a pound of fat. I know to us Americans, we, that was something we could not eat was the fat. And so we had to find a meat dealer that would be willing to sell us meat without fat. And to the Filipinos, that would be a sacrifice for them to give us a whole pound of meat without fat because usually that would be two, they could get two for the price of one, you know, because they even sell the fat. But I know it's nothing, too, as you walk into the open markets to see a pig's head or a cow's head just sitting on the counter. The legs are just laying under the counter. Every part of the pig the Filipinos use. I know is we was raising some pigs at our Bible school, and we had sold one of them, must have been back in September, and we still had one more. There's one of our Bible school students that was taking care of the pig, he said to Brother Cook, why don't you let me butcher it for the convention in October? Brother Cook says, well, it's not quite ready to butcher. He said, I really don't want to butcher it. He said, I'm going to keep it for a while. He said, then we'll either sell it or butcher it. He said, we're not going to butcher it for convention. But this student, he just kept after Brother Cook day after day, a couple weeks, and he said, you know, Brother Cook, let me butcher the pig for convention. I'll give you some good meat for convention. And finally one day, Brother Cook said to him, Jimmy, why are you so anxious to butcher this pig? And he said, well, he said, I'm hungry for pig's brain. He said, if you give me the pig's brain, he said, 
so I can cook it and eat it. He said, I'll butcher the pig for you. So the one morning at convention, Brother Cook left him, butcher the pig, and they said none of the pig went to waste because the different students liked the different parts of the pig. I know, uh, being in the Philippines, there's a lot of things you got to get used to. I know, uh, when you're on a mission field too, there's a lot of adjustments you have to make. I you know, you have to leave your family and friends. You may be gone into a country where they speak a different language than you do. The food and weather may be different. They may have a lot of different customs, and you may wonder, how can I get used to their customs? I you know, if God truly has called you to be a missionary, he'll help you to be able to leave your family and friends, He'll help you be able to learn the language, get used to their culture, get used to their weather. You know, when you're on a mission field too, you may have to do things that you never thought you would ever have to do. And you know, one thing I never thought I would ever have to deal with was lizards. But I know, as I walked into the apartment where I was going to be staying, at night it's nothing to see. 25, 30 lizards just crawling on your ceiling, crawling on your walls at night. And they mainly stay on the windows because they say these lizards will not hurt you. They said, you let them alone, they'll let you alone. And I know it's really kind of fun to watch them sometimes. They chase each other maybe around the room. Or sometimes you'd be walking through your apartment, it might be dark, and a lizard will run out in front of you. Naturally, from being from America, you may think it's a mouse or something. But it's just something that you really had to get used to. I know the first night that I was in the Philippines, went to go to bed that night and there was a lizard right up on the wall, right above my bed. First I thought, am I going to go to bed with that lizard there? But I said, Lord, I said, I'm going to be here for 10 months. I might as well get used to it. I know it was just something, it was just like little pets once you got used to it. <laughs> they say if you let them be in your apartment, they like to eat the bugs and you will not have any problem with bugs and mosquitoes in your apartment. I know during the 10 months I was there, I think it was only maybe one or two months during our rainy season that I had problems with mosquitoes because I just left the lizards there and left them to take care of the lizards. And it was something else that I had to do that I never thought I would ever be able to do was teach the Filipinos English class. I know his brother Cook asked me to teach our freshman junior English or our Bible school. And he gave me the requirements for the class and some of the requirements for the freshman's English was they had to write their personal testimony of how they got saved in English. They had to present to the class in English, plus they had to do it in their language. Then they had like a 3,000 word thesis paper that they had to write in English. I said to the students, I said, I know I'm the first American that ever taught this English class. I said, you may not have, they may not have had to fulfill the requirements in the past. I said, but these are requirements that were given for the class. These are requirements that will be met. One of our students said to me, they said, well, if we have to do our personal testimony in your language, you should have to do your personal testimony of how you got saved in our language. I thought to myself, how would I ever be able to do this? Because at this time, I'd not been able to learn much of the language yet. But I told him, I said, you do your best to do yours in English, and I will do my best to do mine in your language. Filipinos really didn't think I was serious because... Not too many of the Americans ever tried anything like that before, especially when I was only in the country a few months. And I was just thankful how the Lord helped me, how I was able to translate into their language. As I presented to the class in one day, it really meant a lot to them that I would try to do something in their language. I know, but when I went to the Philippines, I said I was going to do whatever I was needed to do. And so, I know the Filipinos are really wonderful people. I know it's just once you... Let the Filipinos realize that you want to be a part of them. Then they make you feel just like you're at home. And there's something else I had to do. When I was in the Philippines, I never thought I would have to do. So I wrote home and told different people that I was doing this. They said, you would never be doing this. And that was taking care of pigs. And as we was raising, we had two pigs at our Bible school. Our students left in March to go home on their summer vacation. We had these two pigs, and different ones were students. Our pastor said to Brother Cook, what are you going to do with the pigs? They said, all the students are leaving. It's just you and Sister Tammy there. I said, what are you going to do with the pigs? And they said, well, they're on Tammy's side of the campus, so she has to take care of them. I said, when well, I said I was coming to the Philippines, I said, do whatever I was needed to do. I guess if it's taking care of pigs, I'll take care of pigs. And that really wasn't a bad job, because I know I took care of them one time, the brother and Sister Cook took care of them the other two times. But I know everyone always said that taking care of pigs was such a dirty job. But when you got to do something, 
You just get used to doing it. It's really not a bad job. And then we sold those, I think it was in May, and got two more little ones in June. And once again, our students went home in our mid-semester break in August. My brother and sister Cook had just got their big shipment from America. And they had a lot of things that they had to get unpacked. They were trying to get them done before the students come back from their vacation. They had the two pigs. I said, well, you're going to be busy this week. I said, don't worry about the pigs. I'll take care of them. Well, naturally, being the only one that was taking care of the pigs, she naturally had to go inside the pen with the pigs to clean out their water trough. Before, Brother Cook said, I'll go in once a day and clean it out. Well, I was the only one taking care of the pigs. So the one day, as I he cleaned the pen all out, dumped the food in the one side, I feel where the pigs are occupied on this side eating, I'll climb in on this side to clean out the water trough. As I climbed in, the two pigs started fighting over their food. One of the pigs started coming straight towards me. And I thought, what am I going to do now? Do I jump out? What do I do? As I just stood there, kept doing what I was doing, clean out the water trough, the pig came over, kept coming towards me, and just started licking feet. Then it would walk around, went back over and start eating, come back and did that two or three times. And then I climbed, after I finished, I climbed out of the pen, and the pig just looked up at me, just like it was saying, you mean you're not as scared of me? And every time after that, that the pigs would even see me walking by their pen, whether it was time for them to eat or whether it wasn't, they would start squealing until I would go over to their pen. And one of our pastors that raised pigs said he never heard of pigs doing this. He said, but the pigs must have realized that you wasn't scared of them, that you cared enough about them, so they would squeal until I went over to their pen. I, know, I never thought I would ever be able to say this, but it was almost like they became your pets. But I know... A song that really helped me a lot when I was on the mission field was that song, and I'm giving my life, Lord, to you. The words that went, first I heard your call, Lord, I tried to give my all, but it seemed I kept a part, reserve within my heart. So I come now once again, place my life within your hands. You're my Savior and friend so true, be my Lord and Master too. I'm giving my life, Lord, to you, to do what you want me to do. And I'm giving you, Lord, all of me, to be what you want me to be. I surrender completely to you, and I'm giving my life, Lord, to you. Love is more than just a word, to be spoken, to be heard. For your love put upon a tree, where in pain you died for me. So when I say that I love you, there's so much more that I must do. Help me be what you want me to be, completely, Lord, for you. I trust this is the desire of each and every one of your hearts, is to totally give your hearts and lives over to the Lord. Be willing to do what he asks for you to do. Tonight I'd like to try to sing a song first in English and also in Ilocano, which was the language that we used a lot in the Philippines. When at first I heard your call, Lord, I tried to give my all, but it seemed I had kept apart, reserved within my heart. So I come now once again, place my life within your hand. You're my Savior and friend so true. Be my Lord and Master too. And I'm giving my life, Lord, to you. To do what you want me to do. And I'm giving you, Lord, all of me. To be what you want me to be. I surrender completely to you. Love is more than just a word To be spoken, to be heard For your love put upon a tree Where in pain you died for me So when I say that I love you There's much more that I must do Help me be what you want me to be Completely, Lord, for you Do what you want me to do, and I'm giving you, Lord, all of me to be what you want me to be. I surrender completely to you, and I'm giving my life, Lord, to you. Idi mange ko ayab mo kaya ko na isukuti amen ko kem kasman na riga kanya. Tanglem nag toy rig nag, I toy yak nag money tan, he sad mo piakutai man, 
You know, we need to go out to show the love of God and let people know that God can make a difference in our lives. You know, just as the prodigal son's father welcomed his son back home, Jesus is standing there with outstretched arms, waiting for others to come to him. You know, God may call us to do something. We know it's the least that we can do to do it, because after all, he gave his only son so that we could have our sins forgiven. You know, in John 15, 16, it says, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. You know, Christ has chosen us to be... Christ has chosen us to do a work for Him, but we must be willing to do it. We know with the call of God comes the strength and ability to fulfill the call. God will always be right there by our side to help us fulfill the call that He has placed in our life. We know God may not call everyone to be a missionary. The main thing is, whatever God has called you to do, just be willing to do it. We know at times, too, God may call you to do something. Maybe you don't feel that you can fulfill the call. I know as I felt God call me to be a missionary. I said, Lord, that's not what I want to do. There's no way I could ever make it as a missionary. But we know there is no peace, there is no joy. Until I said, Lord, here am I. Send me, use me to do whatever you have for me to do. We know many are called, but few are chosen. God has many to follow him, but only a few are willing. You see in Matthew chapter 9, verse 37, 38, it says, Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. We know the harvest is ready, but where are the laborers? They're willing to go out and to reap the harvest. We see the Christian work is compared to harvesting wheat. What if someone had planted wheat? They just said, why should I tend to the wheat? I'll just wait and let someone else do it. We know what would happen to the wheat. We know it's the same in harvesting souls. If everyone waits and someone else to witness to someone, they may perish and be lost for eternity. We know if everyone waits on someone else to do a job, the job will never be done. We know we need to do all we can to win the loss for the Lord. Because there's a world out there that's dying lost. People are reaching out, wanting someone to care. But what are we doing to reach them? We know whether we're in America or whether we're in a foreign country, there are still souls to be won. So let's think for a class song in Bible school. It's time to reap the harvest now. The words of Jesus said, say not, we have time to reap the harvest. No need to hurry to his fields. While we tarry, another soul will perish. We can't afford to just sit still. For many just outside these walls are lost in lonely lives with no hope at all. It's time to reap the harvest now. Many souls are dying. Can't you hear their crying? Love can turn the lives around. He's given us the power. This is our finest hour. It's time to reap the harvest now. Somewhere a child cries, abused by hands of anger. No one seems to hear his cry. A young boy and girl doesn't think that life's worth living. They're planning now their suicide. We must reach to meet their needs. Jesus said that when you do, you've done it unto me. We know we don't have time to wait. We need a spiritual harvest now. We tarry and wait on someone else to witness to someone. They may perish and be lost for eternity. And there's lots of lonely people that feel they have no hope. We need to do all we can to show them God's love and to help them realize that there is hope through Jesus. You know, when you're dealing with people, too, you never know when you might give someone their last salvation message. So I shared this with our Bible school students over in the Philippines. I said, we're going into the hospital. I said, we're dealing with a different group of people each week. I said, some people are there, the same people each week. I said, but there's other people that is not there each week. I said, we're dealing with a different group of people each week. I said, you never know when it might be your last chance, when you might be the last person they would have a chance to witness to someone. And there was one man that I met right after I went to the Philippines and started on a hospital ministry. He had been in a tricycle accident. Both of his legs were broken. He had no feeling in either one of his arms. And the doctors really gave him no hope of ever walking again, ever having feeling back in his arms. And the young man had just really just given up. He's probably about 23 to 25 years old. He had just really given up. As we'd go into his room, he was in a room where there was probably about 10 to 15 people. And we had a service there each week. And it just seemed like each week God kept drawing us back to his room to have a service there. Week after week, he'd just sit in his bed, act like he was sleeping, just like he really didn't care. But week after week, we'd give him a track. And it was just really something to see. As we walked into his room some, this one day, and he said to us, he said, I've given my life over to Jesus. He said, do you have a Bible? He said, I want to read the Bible. He said, I want to learn more about God. He said, I thank you for praying for me. He said, the doctors have given me hope now. 
He said, They're, they've taken a cast off my legs. He said, I'm starting to be able to walk. He said, I'm even getting feeling back in my arms. It was just really a blessing to see how the change that God made in this life. And as I said to our students, many times they said, is there any use? They said, we've dealt with him for at least three or four months. We had dealt with this young man. And they said, is there any use? I said, we're not giving up. I said, someday that young man will be saved. And it was just really a blessing to see how God really moved in our hospital ministry. I know Christ has chosen us to do work for him, but we must be willing to do it. We know has God placed the call in your life? Are you struggling with saying yes to what the Lord has called you to do? No, there's no peace, there's no joy, unless we're doing God's perfect will. Let's just be willing to say, Lord, here am I. Send me to do whatever you have for me to do. Amen. Let's stand together tonight. Praise the Lord. I appreciate Sister Tammy sharing her heart tonight and and uh, some of her experiences and and uh, I've had the opportunity to go limited. Our family went one time on a missions trip and uh, it changes your whole life. The way that you look at uh, the world, the way that you look at life and uh, uh, people that really need the Lord. Amen. And um, uh, it's it's really sad to say, but in our in our nation in our society, I've I, I don't know that I've really seen the hunger that I saw when I went to the the nation of Guatemala and saw people that were poverty stricken and uh, and yet the hunger that they had for God, Amen. You just all you had to do was just tell them about Jesus, and they soaked it up. They were hungry for it, and here people laugh at you. And, and uh, make fun of you and say that uh, he's just, you know, that's not for me. That's that's a crutch for people that are too weak. But uh, it's not like that in other places, is it? And uh, I appreciate those that are willing to go and to serve uh, the Lord. And and um, uh, when are you planning to go, Sister Tammy? In October? And it'll be for how long? Three years. Most likely it will Three years. Okay. All right. Maybe somebody has a question. I, I know that uh, maybe you have a question you'd like to ask Sister Tammy. I didn't think about this earlier, but a lot of times people have questions. Anybody? If not, that's... How much uh, do you have to run a place? Or are you on compound? Or? Um, we've rated our mission. Like we're, our Bible schools, we have um, two apartments for the physical living one. And we have another apartment for like another big family. Which there's a, another young girl that's planning on going back to the Philippines in October with me if she can raise the necessary finances. She just graduated from the Bible school next to it, ninety five. And she's planning on going back also. So two of us will be staying in the apartment there together. So you have an apartment there on the compound. Anybody else? What is your biggest need, you personally? It's just um, the hardest part right now is just getting raised in the monthly support. You know, that you, the amount that you need to really live on each month. Mm-hmm. How much do you have? Do you have a budget that you have to raise? They asked it, um, we raised 500 a month. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think, all together for like the expenses for three years, including your airfare to the Philippines and back. And to have 500 a month is like $20,000 to raise, you know, to cover each thing. Exactly. Some of it, you know, you raise just through itineration, and some of it is through like um, the monthly support. Anybody else? Did you try the pig brains? <laughs> oh, okay. I was just curious about that. Yeah. That's something the Filipinos, the Filipinos understand that us as Americans cannot eat the pig's brain, eat all the parts of the pigs, the fat. I know when you go into some of the pastor's homes, they might fix a meal for you. If you even just stop in at their church for service, they don't know you're coming. They will insist that you stay for a meal afterwards. And many a times, 
they may use a lot of the fat as they're cooking in their meal. And you may put a spoon of vegetables and meat or whatever they are fixed on your plate, and you may get a big pile of fat. But the Filipinos understand that that's as Americans cannot eat it, so they are not offended if we don't eat. But when you are at their homes, the Filipinos eat two to three times as much as we do here in America. And if you do not eat a lot, they get offended. They think that you do not like their kind of food. Come back in a couple of weeks and we'll show you that they probably don't eat two or three times as much as people around here do. <laughs> concerned about the lizards, you can tell that. <laughs> Yeah. 
on Saturdays that we had our hospital ministry practice, I try to fix them something. And one Saturday I made them just homemade pizza. And to them to have a piece of pizza was really a treat to them. I mean, it wasn't a complete meal for them, but it was even a snack. But I know really anything like that. And they don't eat much meat because it's really expensive. Like a pound of beef or a pound of pork might be about four American dollars. And so they don't really use that much meat. So the one day I, I made them hamburgers. I gave them a hamburger on a bun. And that was just really a treat to them. It's just like they didn't know what to do with it because there was just so much meat. They usually do not get that much meat. So really just about anything that Americans would make for them, they really enjoy. They enjoy trying different like American foods. <coughs> All right. Well, I've appreciated her coming by and, and uh, take some time and look at the pictures and see some of the work. And um, pick up a prayer card. I guess you have a prayer card back there. And uh, uh, remember her in prayer. She's itinerating and we're going to be going in the month of October. Why don't we pray together as we close tonight? Heavenly Father, we thank you this evening for. Your messenger, we thank you for the message to our hearts. And Father, I pray this evening that, that you will provide for Sister Tina, Lord, that you meet the needs that she has in her ministry, in her life. Lord, that you'll go above and beyond. We know that you're faithful to do, to perform what you have called us to do. Father, I pray now that you will give her traveling mercies, watch over her, keep her safe. Keep the anointing fresh upon her heart. Lord, in times of discouragement, Father, I pray that your touch and rest upon her life, that her strength would be in the calling that you placed upon her heart and her soul. Father, I ask tonight that you'll help us to expand our vision more, to look beyond our own small circle, and to see that there is a widened harvest field that surrounds us, souls that are in the valley of decision, that need a Savior. Lord, help us to do what we can where we are to win souls for the kingdom of God. Lord, Lord we'll thank you for it tonight in Jesus. God bless you tonight. You can consider yourself dismissed. If you got any other questions about the lizards or whatever, see. Just stop. God bless you. Remember, Saturday morning, 9 o'clock for the guys.